Natalie Chisholm from the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to our ASEAN Forum. In particular, I'd like to welcome the representatives of the Southeast Asian Diplomatic Corps, including Consuls General of Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Timor Leste, and the Philippines. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. The Sydney Southeast Asia Centre is a university-wide initiative here at the University of Sydney. We were established about six years ago to bring together and raise the profile of the extensive Southeast Asia expertise that exists here on campus. We currently have exactly 501 members across all the faculties at the university and a total membership of over 3,000 people in Australia and across the region. This includes students and professionals. We engage these academics and over 200 research students in a range of research activities, education programs and outreach events. One of those events is this ASEAN Forum which we host annually to bring together people from an array of different backgrounds who share a common interest in Southeast Asia. This is our seventh annual ASEAN Forum. In the past, we have covered issues including ASEAN and China, women and China, and environmental sustainability in, excuse me, not women in China, women in ASEAN, um, and, in, <laughs> and environmental sustainability in ASEAN. And this year we are looking at ASEAN and the digital revolution. Today we have speakers from across the region who will be examining the impact of this digital revolution and the challenges that ASEAN must overcome to reach its full digital potential. We are also very interested in the question of what and who is being left behind. We hope that this will be a forum for building dialogue, establishing relationships and learning from each other. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Di Gregorio, who is the Asia Foundation's Vietnam country representative based in Hanoi. And a personal anecdote, I first met Mike in January in Hanoi when I was leading a field school to Vietnam on urbanization. And we had the privilege of having Mike speak to us for an hour, and then he had to rush off to a meeting, and the students were all very upset when he had to leave. So when we were thinking about who we wanted to invite to this ASEAN Forum, he was a natural choice. His work at Asia Foundation has been focused on how disruptive technologies might affect the development trajectories of advanced middle-income countries. Most recently, this work has expanded to include the widespread social, <coughs> political and ecological disruption that is likely to occur as a result of climate change. He has overseen initiatives and projects that use digital financial services and new technologies like blockchain to empower vulnerable people and to improve climate resilience. Today he will be talking to us about digital technology, climate change and the fourth industrial revolution and how we can work with our ASEAN partners to shape a future in which the challenges of climate change and the fourth industrial revolution can be met justly and equitably. Dr. Di Gregorio will speak for about 30 minutes and we will have a brief amount of time for Q&A at the end. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind you to turn your phones off or onto silent. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Di Gregorio to the stage. I think what, let me turn, turn this on. Excuse me for a second. I think what Nat Natalie likes is uh, my fear of public speaking and my uh, tendency to over-prepare. So um, I have uh, some notes that I'm going to work off of. That's all. Um, if you don't mind. Um, the title of my presentation today is the Digital Technology and Climate Change and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, I'm going to start in, in a strange place. Um, in the opening act of an American theatrical play uh, by the skin of our teeth, the Anthropus family is in their home in early 20th century Excelsior, New Jersey, as a wall of ice slowly descends from the north. 
the daily movements of the ice, ice sheet, which threatens the entire population of the northeastern United States, is followed closely by the family in a series of radio broadcasts and conversations about them. We came through the depression by the skin of our teeth, Sabina, the family's maid, says. One more tight squeeze like that, and where will we be? Experts have told us, to go to the next slide. Experts have told us that humans are really bad at evaluating risk especially if the immediate rewards of ignoring them are high. We already have some cost in the risky behavior, and we are able to rationalize that the future threat is so far off that predictions can't be tested. Like the Antropus family, we imagine that we will somehow be able to save ourselves by the skin of our team. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has told us that in order to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, greenhouse gas emissions need to be about 45% below their 2010 levels. And by 2030, uh, by 2030, and by 2050, we should be carbon neutral. Have we reached a point where information like this catalyzes us into action? Or is this just another line in the sand? In 2018, global energy-related carbon emissions grew by 560 million tons, equal to the total emissions from aviation, and driven by a strong global economy. One trillion kilowatt hours were added to global electricity networks. The resulting increase in generation saw the power sector account for about two-thirds of the total increase in emissions. Coal-fired power plants were the single largest contributor to the growth in emissions, <clears throat> accounting for half of the total global increase, about 280 million tons. Coal now accounts for about 30% of CO2 emissions globally, with Asia, where the average coal thermal power plant is only 12 years old, leading the increase. The fact of the matter is quite clear. While renewables are an increasing proportion of the growing global energy supply, accounting for about 45% of the increase in electricity in 2018, the greater part of new energy demand globally is still being met with fossil fuels. The impacts have become apparent. 18 of the 19 warmest years on record have occurred since 2000. Also since 2000, average winter surface temperatures in the Arctic have been consistently higher than long-term averages. With the 2018 average winter temperature 8 degrees Celsius higher um, in July uh, of this year, above the Arctic Circle in Sweden, there was a record temperature of 37.5 degrees, or about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. At one point in um, early 2018, temperatures recorded from the Arctic were 20 degrees higher, Celsius higher than the long-term average for that period. In the same year, over two-thirds of the summer ice cover vanished. While we are not likely to see an Arctic free, uh, ice-free Arctic soon, Peter Wattles, director of the Polar Ocean Physics Group at the University of Cambridge, has noted that a totally ice-free Arctic summer would increase the impacts of CO2 already in the atmosphere by 50%. In itself, this would render the IPCC's project projections grossly inaccurate. If climate catastrophe is to be averted, emissions will need to, be, will need to decrease rapidly and, in fact, reverse course by mid-century. If this does not seem likely, then we need to start talking more about living with the profound impacts climate change will have on our lives, our political and economic systems, and the planet. And to make matters worse, we will need to think about those impacts in a context of growing geopolitical tensions, ambitious national development strategies, and the disruptive impacts of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. 
these are issues that have been in my mind uh, and a topic of discussion among colleagues within the Asia Foundation for the past several years. We began to focus on the impacts of the fourth industrial revolution, a 4IR, on the development tra trajectories of advanced middle income countries, countries with gross national incomes between 4,000 and 20,000 US dollars per capita. More recently, we have added the clear possibility of widespread social, political, and ecological disruption caused by climate change or one of the many crises it may trigger. This approach takes us away from the idea that catastrophic climate change can be limited to what Jen Bendel calls deep adaptation. Bendel argues that the severe disruptions of our lives and societies caused by climate change will render current institutional arrangements, the rules-based order, incapacitated. That is, we won't be able to respond to the widespread scope of suffering and conflict with our current national and global institutions. This scenario for collapse is now being widely debated among communities of interest on the online. However, you don't need to accept Bendel's conclusions to recognize that we will live in a world whose climate is radically different than anything we have ever known. And that this change will have profound impacts on social and political systems, geopolitical power, national and global economies, agriculture, the movement of populations within and outside national borders, and of course, every living creature and the planetary ecosystem we rely on. These are huge issues which deserve much more detailed assessment than I can pro provide here. I encourage you to read more on your own. In this brief presentation and in the context of this meeting, I can just point to a, in a direction that myself and some of my colleagues are exploring and mention what my office has been doing with regard to one area of concern, the use of digital technology as a means of reducing vulnerabilities and increasing resilience to climate change. Maybe Bendel is wrong, and we as a species will scrape through somehow. England was running out of firewood when a good use of coal was discovered during the first industrial revolution. The fossil fuel revolution unlocked carbon that na nature had sequestered in the earth as a source of energy, first for steam engines, and later as liquid and gaseous hydrocarbons to fuel internal combustion engines and turbines, produce plastics and fertilizers, rub on babies' bottoms, and save whales from certain extinction. The fossil-fueled industrial revolution also created great wealth, and alongside it, a new class of factory workers made up of former peasants driven from their homes into cities as their plots were taken from them, no longer could feed them, or their ambitions exceeded the opportunities on the farm. Whether we like it or not, the legacies of the first industrial revolution are still with us, as our civilization remains wedded to the carbon nature had kept outside our reach. As Vaclav Smil noted, ours is a fossil fuel civilization, and energy is its currency. The second industrial revolution matched the capacity of industry to produce goods at low cost with a labor force able to buy them. This is the Fordist revolution that ushered in the age of mass production and with it the consumer society. The second industrial revolution, which began with improved efficiencies within physical plants, spread across the globe as a search for lower cost, cost platforms for export production. Importing demand in this way allowed for increased purchasing power in rich, richer countries, even though real wages stagnated, while also creating new opportunities in the developing world. That, in turn, fueled rising standards of living. In 2018, private consumption accounted for nearly 70% of the United States' $18.6 trillion economy. China and India are both on a similar pathway to consumption-led economies. 
In Vietnam, where I've lived for 27 years, the middle and affluent classes are expected to rise from 12 million in 2012 to 33 million, one third of the population in 2020. While the first industrial revolution led to widespread resilient reliance on fossil fuels, and the second created consumer societies, the third industrial revolution, the digital revolution, freed us from the physical tethers through information and communication technology, like mainframe computing, personal computing, the internet, smartphones, and now cloud computing. The move from analog technology and mechanical devices to digital technology dramatically disrupted industries, especially global communications, logistics, finance, and commerce. It also created a new class of billionaires as information technology led to the automation of production, made it possible to take supply chains global, and created a worldwide consumer culture. Each of the first three industrial revolutions represented profound change, and their legacies remain with us. The digital revolution, in particular, continues to alter nearly every industry, transforming how people live, work, communicate, shop, and manage wealth. The fourth industrial revolution, 4IR, is now beginning to cross boundaries between the physical, digital, and biological worlds through, for example, artificial intelligence, gene editing, virtual reality, microchip implants in biological organisms, 3D printing, and breakthrough approaches to governance through cryptographic technologies like blockchain. While these technologies seem like the provenance of some far-off future world, 4IR technologies like gene therapies and blockchain applications in finance are already appearing in parts of the world that are still adopting the mass production and digital technologies of the second and third industrial revolutions. ASEAN member states have embraced 4IR cautiously, aware of the opportunities but also the costs. For example, the use of AI and automation of manufacturing and 3D printing in the supply of spare parts reverses the economic rationale for offshore allowing businesses in low- and middle-income countries to compete on the basis of quality due to automation, and, uh, while businesses in higher-income countries can compete on cost due to lower labor requirements. In, in both of these cases, the disruptive technologies of 4IR would also have an impact on employment, creating the need for fewer workers in more technically sophisticated jobs. ASEAN member states are aware of these possibilities as broad impacts on their economies, educational systems, and workforce. They are less aware of the relationship to climate change. Disruption is the common thread linking the climate crisis and 4 i While each industrial revolution unsettled previous orders, the current period of disruption combines an existential risk situated in a changing climate with revolutions in how cities are managed, trade is conducted, goods are transported, food is produced, medicines are dispensed, work is organized, and populations are monitored. And like previous industrial revolutions, 4IR is increasing gaps between rich and poor as it creates a new class of billionaires and global corporations that can use knowledge of its tools to increase their wealth and markets. While it is impossible to know where this leads, it is possible to look over the horizon at how emerging technologies may overlap with the projected impacts of climate change. Looking over the horizon like this requires a bit of speculation about nonlinear impacts. Unfortunately, we already have plenty of examples. Consider, consider this, if the climate impact is longer droughts, then one possible second level impact might be salinization of groundwater in coastal agricultural areas. And the third level impact might be crop failure. If you wanted, you could take this to the fourth derivative, maybe internal migration. As you go through this process, for every climate change impact, 
in a particular region, you would get a matrix of derivative impacts. Once you have laid out the possibilities like this, you can develop interventions that could reduce vulnerabilities and increase risks. This was actually the Rockefeller Foundation's Resilient Cities approach that I'm describing. Um, this approach is different from the predict and prevent approaches used in traditional disaster risk management because it assumes the impacts are hard to predict and thus require a wider scope and impossible to prevent and thus require a focus on vulnerability and resilience. Let me give you one quick example. A strong tropical storm struck central Vietnam's Tua Tin Hue province in the fall of 2014. At the time, the province was focused on preventing a flood disaster in the city of Hue, a UNESCO heritage site. Downstream from the city, tens of thousands of fish held in cages in the Tanzan Lagoon died. The cause of death was rapid change in salinity. A few low-cost salinity sensors able to send real-time messages to subscribers could have warned fish farmers in advance allowing them to either move their cages or harvest their fish. I point this out because it is a digital intervention that emerges out of the kind of investigation of the derivative impacts of climate change that I have just described. It does not assume that the impacts can be prevented, but that technology can reduce vulnerability and increase resilience. And furthermore, many of these interventions are either do-it-yourself maker solutions or products created by social enterprises. In fact, you can find the solution I just described being used by shrimp farmers in Bangladesh on the Global Innovation Exchange website. These types of low-cost technical and digital interventions are, only, are limited only by the imagination. The Internet of Things, Digital Revolution, 4IR, and the Maker Movement are making them possible. Um, I could give you more examples, but um, unfortunately we don't have time today. What I can say is that the first step in thinking through how climate change and 4IR intersect begins by with finding a starting point in your own institution. For my office, that begins with our areas of focus. Over the past five years, we have deepened our engagement with the private sector in areas like disaster risk management small and medium enter enterprise development, strengthening business associations and agricultural cooperatives, food safety and providence, green finance and energy. We've also built up our expertise on labor issues through projects that support internal and foreign labor migrants. This is a full plate for seven program staff who develop, implement, and manage their projects. We are aided through the collaboration with Asia Foundation's Senior Director for Technology, John Carr. John and his team introduced us to the possibilities of blockchain and some very capable technology partners. Um, I'd like to now turn to some of those projects. Digital financial services. Climate change induced natural disasters currently affect an estimated 230 million people worldwide. Droughts, flooding, fire, unusual insect pests, and other climate related events are especially threatening to those who have limited capacity to cope. Not only do they have to face the direct impacts of these shocks and stresses, they also need to deal with the indirect impacts, such as scarcity pricing for food, water, and building materials degradation of land through erosion and deposition, and of course, the health risks from polluted water and lack of sanitation. Any or all of these derivative impacts can be devastating, and with no hope and no savings, many choose their only path to escape, migration, which creates a whole new set of burdens, both on the migrant and the receiving communities. It has been clear for many years that financial services offer a variety of means for individuals and households to save, borrow, and insure in preparation for 
and response to shocks and stresses, both known and unanticipated. For example, three Mercy Corps studies in the Philippines and Nepal found that households that had savings had better outcomes post-disaster than those that did not, and that a mix of formal and informal savings is important since access to cash is crucial in a post-disaster context. However, in many ways, this is an old view of the potential of financial services to improve resilience for poor households into climate-related shocks and stresses. As we shift to digital platforms and e-commerce, a range of new services are becoming available that allow for greater pooling of resources within globally dispersed communities and easier access to goods warehoused far from the disaster. This includes access to lines of credit, ability to make peer-to-peer -peer transfers, improved security of savings, the ability to make remittances, the ability to pool money for disaster relief and disperse it directly to affected households and individuals, and the ability to make online purchases for repair of homes and vehicles, restocking store shelves, and purchasing farm equipment, just to name a few. None of this was obvious to us until we began our work with the Vietnam Bank for Social Policies, a project funded through Australia's DFAT business partnership platform. VBSP is the world's third largest microfinance institution. It has 7 million poor rural account holders and $8 billion in outstanding loans. It is also Vietnam's de facto social welfare home dispersing government support for veterans, the disabled, and widows, while also providing loans for education, small business, and home repairs, including more than 300,000 loans for repair of homes damaged by natural disasters. Our work with VBSP is now focused on building a digital platform. We have already seen some of the benefits. Roughly 5 million clients currently receive notifications by SMS. And since this system was introduced late last year, customer savings have increased by roughly 40% in the surveyed provinces. VBSP is the, in the process of becoming a MasterCard member institution, which would make it possible for its account holders to buy and sell on the internet using their savings for payments. The mobile application will initially allow the bank's clients to monitor transactions. Over time, however, new services will be added, including the capacity to make transfers to other account holders and to make and receive payments via QR code. At that point, VBSP accounts will become the equivalent of mobile wallets. Digital identities for short-time temporary workers. The Asia Foundation's Kathmandu office has a project similar to Hanoi's collaboration with VBSP and MasterCard. That project, Shubayatra, is the largest and most comprehensive platform for immigration and financial services for Nepali migrants. One of Shubayatra's important innovation is the use of blockchain-based digital identities to protect the safety and security of migrants. Internal and foreign migration is expected to increase as the effects of climate change bear down on vulnerable regions. We already see this taking place in India, Guatemala, and the sub-Saharan states. The Hanoi office has taken the capacity to create digital personal identities using blockchain technologies and applied it to work in temporary short-term employment, the gig economy that is expected to become increasingly common within four hours. Through a collaboration with Zupia, a Hanoi-based temporary maid service, and Infinity Blockchain Lab, a blockchain service provider in Ho Chi Minh City, and with support from the U.S. Department of Human Rights and Labor, we are developing a mobile platform that links registered own account maids to prospective clients through an Uber-like application that combines, combines digital identities and e-contracting to create a record of employment. With further support from the business partnership platform, Care Vietnam has joined us in using this combination of digital identity and work history 
to create a microfinance saving and loan service through a large domestic bank. This combination of digital identity and work history has also has another set of positive outcomes. The maids, and as this project rolls out, other temporary service providers are primarily migrants from rural areas. Creating a work history can be used to apply for temporary registration in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, which once provided would allow migrants to access education for their children and medical services at public clinics. Food safety in Providence. APEC Connect is an ongoing project funded by the Australian Embassy in Hanoi. The project is building a blockchain-based identity and proof of Providence platform for Vietnamese dragon fruit that empowers smallholder farmers as well as provides all participants in the supply chain from buyers to consumers with useful information related to food safety and handling. The technology we develop together with an Australian firm, Ethitrade, can create trust and transparency through digital compliance records. The project uses QR codes and that can be scanned by mobile phones to access information on a need-to-know basis. We are now working with Ethitrade to open the platform to other agricultural projects. We anticipate that 4IR will completely change agriculture as we know it. As large farms producing cereals face increasing climate pressure and small farms using resource conserving methods and risk reducing cropping become more important sources of fruits and vegetables. This work in developing a blockchain based safe food supply chain is our first attempt to address this issue. Over the longer term, the supply chain application will need to support farmers with additional services like detailed mapping of meteorological and soil conditions, information on pest outbreaks and means of controlling them, and like our work with Zupia, e-contracting and financial services. I just described three projects we, we, that we've done with bilateral aid. Uh, we, we actually have many more that are simmering on our back burners. Um, but now I want to turn for a few minutes to say something about ASEAN. Currently, 63% of the population of ASEAN's 10 member states have access to the internet. About 61% are also active social media users with 56% accessing social media through their mobile phones. This, um, in other words, 92% of active social media users access social media on their mobile phones. This high rate of mobile phone access also suggests that a very high percentage of internet users are also accessing the internet on their mobile phones. This creates amazing possibilities for the expansion of mobile services from financial and transportation services to some of the proprietary projects I had mentioned today. Well, that's all great for the population that is connected to the internet and social media. What about the other 40%? ASEAN's population with access to the internet has grown rapidly. From 11.5 million in 2000 to 414 million in 2018. However, as the World Bank's 2016 World Development Report noted, even as internet access grows, the gap in access within countries can be as great or greater than those between. For example, a 2017 study by the Association of Internet Providers of Indonesia found that while 72% of the country's urban residents had access to the internet, only 48% of the rural population did. And in Vietnam, where 64% of the population lives in rural areas, rural people make up only 37.5% of the internet users. Mobile broadband at an affordable price is the clearest route to providing rural people access to the information, services, and scale economies that internet access offers. Are they ready? In my office's research with the Vietnam Bank for Social Policies, 
we found that almost all of the bank's rural clients had access to a mobile phone, so about 97%. 58% uh, had a feature phone, and 47% had a smartphone. While there were significant differences in access and use by gender, almost 100% of the bank's clients under 40 years old, and more than 80% of the bank's clients over 40 years old, use their phones to read and write text messages. On the other hand, while 83% of the male and 68% of the bank's female clients under the age of 40 used the internet to get information, only 41.5% of the older population did. There are many issues like cybersecurity, digital finance, and access to information that I could mention here. And I suspect that they will be covered in the presentations that follow. Our work in Vietnam, including our new work creating a safe internet environment and liberate internet, internet users, starts with knowing our clients. Mobile broadband may be the way how rural people and people living in remote areas can and will access the internet. But there are many steps to getting there. The perfect application for a vulnerable community may fail simply because the beneficiary population is not ready. In our work with PBSP, we started with SMS messaging, and within three months, five million clients were using the service. We saw this as a gateway to the use of their phones for banking services. Our rollout strategy for the digital platform builds on our success with SMS messaging and applies what we learned about mobile internet access by place of residence, age, gender, and ethnicity. Even in a region with expanding internet access, the digital divide is still real. Bridging that gap to reduce vulnerabilities and increase resilience requires both technical capacity and deep knowledge of the needs and capacities of potential beneficiaries. I want to thank you for your attention and I uh, hope this remaining uh, workshop is useful for you. Thank you so much, Mike. Yes, um, please take a seat. And we have a little bit of time for questions. There are roving mics. So if you have a question, I want to ask you to please give your name and your affiliation and try and keep it to a question rather than a comment. Um, we've got some questions, Ben. Um, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Sophie Weber. I'm a lecturer here in the School of Geosciences. I'm lecturing in um, Environmental Studies and Geography. Um, I was wondering, uh, thank you for your presentation. Super fascinating examples. I was really um, excited to learn about them. But I'm wondering whether you're thinking at all about the environmental impact of these digital technologies themselves. Um, particularly around things like blockchain, which are incredibly resource intensive and will have a large impact on things like climate change if we allow them to keep, continue unabated. That is, that is an enormous issue. And, you know, because uh, blockchain is immutable, right? So it will maintain records forever and ever and ever and ever with the growing demand and growing use. And, you know, uh, that is a deep concern for everybody who works on blockchain. And uh, we don't know what the solution is right now. Um, many of the uh, uh, data service providers have committed to fully uh, uh, to use a renewable energy in all of their data uh, data banks. Uh, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Azure, uh, Apple, also. Uh, but I, that's not going to cover all the blockchain uh, usage on those. Uh, data services. So yes, that's a huge problem. Uh, I don't know how it's going to be resolved, but uh, it's it's a big concern. Yes, please. Um, I have a question. Ben Bland from the Lowy Institute. I run the Southeast Asia Project. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, Michael, you spoke about the digital divide in terms of access to the internet, but I'm wondering about the censorship divide which is now growing across 
Southeast Asia, many governments in the region are bringing in new laws to control access to information, to limit it, putting pressure on big tech platforms like Google and Facebook. So do you think this does represent a threat to the sort of entrepreneurship and innovation you've been talking about? Or can Southeast Asian governments, if you like, follow the China model? of controlling speech on the internet, um, controlling the platforms, but still allowing some degree of innovation to flourish. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is another deep concern. And uh, you know, we, we look at this, and when, I, when I say we don't know how this is going to turn out, that's kind of what I'm trying to telegraph. Um, we, we just don't know. And it's, it's probably a wrong approach to say the West and the rest uh, because we, we know that uh, the security apparatuses, whether it's police or internal securities, have access to all of these sources and continuously demand access to these sources, whether you're in a Western country or a country with a liberal <coughs> democratic heritage or if you're in China. In China, and that model is just much more visible and evident. Um, the, uh, the, the question of whether it will hinder uh, is also a good one. Um, in, our, in our project with the Bank for Social Policy, we had a, a much cheaper solution uh, to building this digital platform, which involved hosting the bank's client data on a, a, a server in Indonesia that's run by MasterCard. It's called their financial inclusion platform. The financial inclusion platform provides a low-cost data service uh, to microfinance institutions like BBSP. But uh, the government of Vietnam, through the State Bank of Vietnam, refused to allow us to host the data abroad, which then required the State, uh, State Bank of Vietnam to allocate about $12 million to the Bank for Social Policy to build its own data center. And MasterCard is like, you know, we'll, whatever, you know, it's nice that you have that, but you will never have the type of security that we have. Uh, unfortunately, you know, those are the kinds of things that you confront when, when people actually don't know how access is uh, provided and security is maintained in these kinds of networks. Mike, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Please join me.